so I'm, by the way, all this, the source for my slides are up at this URL. Uh, if you want to take a look at it, it's also on the actual talk description thing. So first, a, a little about me. Um, I started in the open source world at about 12 years old with a Linux distribution that was randomly installed on a computer, and I was trying to figure out how to install Windows on it and discovered there was video games on it, and I didn't care at that, after that point. Um, my first actual introduction where I was understanding what I was doing happened when I was about 16 years old with Red Hat 7.3. Um, I contributed actually to my first open source project at the age of 17. Uh, I made a couple bug fixes that were in WordPress, and those bugs have now been fixed. Um, I also I started my first open source project that was my, my own when I was about 18, which was basically a plug-in to DocuWiki. So I pretty much love open source. I, I, was, I was drawn to this, this idea of, um, of community, of a group of individuals who, who using communication methods that weren't person to person, but through the internet to actually accomplish things. Things were, uh, from my perspective, were actually getting done and it was quite fascinating. Um, and really, nobody cared that I was some shy teenager on the other side of the world. They, they respected me for the, what I was doing and contributing. So this talk isn't really about me. It's more about why you should contribute to open source by starting your own project. Um, so the first thing that I always think is, is the greatest part of doing it is that you can start using it as a playground. You can test all the different things that are all those weird programming methodologies that you hear about all the time, that stuff that you read on Hacker News that people have like these amazing, insightful comments about that turn out to be just completely bollocks and not really useful. You can test this all out in an ecosystem that is contained and small. So you can see it from an almost archaeological standpoint of is this an actual successful way of doing things? Um, the other cool thing is when you actually get an open source project where people are contributing to, you start learning how to actually manage people, which is, is actually an interesting life lesson if you have any, any desire to become that guy who probably is you hate right now telling you what to do at your job. The right ways of how to, how to project, how to, how to tell a group of people what needs to be done and how to accomplish that task, that's great. Um, the other thing is that you will make someone's life easier. At 3 a.m., you probably all experienced that programming, programming kind of fear of, oh crap, our website's down. How do we get it back up? Well, I'm going to start searching GitHub to see if something's there. And you generally find someone who has a very insightful code block with a bunch of links on how he solved this issue. It's pretty awesome. And finally, sometimes you might get a free beer or coffee out of it which I think is the most important part, mainly. Um, this has actually happened to me a couple times where randomly people at a user group meeting or a conference have come up to me and said, hey, you, you developed uh, Django contacts. That saved us hours of work because you wrote out an entire model of how contacts are supposed to be done. Here's a free coffee. Of course, they don't offer me contract work, so it's not the greatest thing, but free beverages is good. So here are my kind of what I think the 10 things you should do if you actually want to start an open source project. So, number one, source control. Have a unified place where all your code is. That's kind of simple now with GitHub and if you actually want to go the open source route and make sure that everything's open source, GitLab is also good. Um, I, I suggest Git mainly because it is somewhat of now our industry standard source control, which is sad because it is a horrible, horrible system. But you really shouldn't be afraid of Git. As an example, here are five steps to reattach your head, if that ever happens. <laughs> so, number two, developer documentation. Um, this is actually really useful, especially for anyone who doesn't really do a lot of of development and are trying to get their feet wet. So you're also helping the community. So toss something up in your readme file that has like instructions on how to install like from the requirements file, from pip, uh, virtual, and, and, and describe your entire workflow. And the great thing about this is that your, your community will actually benefit from this because you're teaching, you're teaching your way of doing it. 
Now, your way could have some inc incorrect things or be wrong or not be useful anymore. Maybe it's 2015 and you're still, I don't remember what would we used before virtual n, but it's at least written down in a document. Um, you can toss it up in your readme file or actually have a contributing file or a developer's file where you can input all that information. So the third thing, unit tests. The worst thing in the world. Um, unit tests are very important because it actually, unit tests are important regardless of anything, but what makes them more important in the open source world is that you are creating your own community and you have to start with the right programming methodologies from the get-go. So this means that you really should start writing unit tests. Um, another kind of key thing is making sure that you can run your testing environment in one simple command. Don't have a gazillion environment variables that have to go before it to get it to run. Make sure it's something as simple as py, uh, python setup py testing or python test test.py. So the first one, Make sure you have an issue tracker. This could also be used for feature requests. Um, it's great because it's an actual area and you as the project leader should also be writing feature requests or, or issues within this as well so that when there are some issues within the project, anyone who's kind of wants to just contribute to it has a place to do that. So the fifth thing is have a change log of all the issues and tracking that relate to the release numbers. There's not much in there. Number six, have some type of continuous integration system. Uh, this is beneficial if you use um, kind of the more modern CI systems that do uh, branch-based uh, testing. Uh, it's one unified area that shows what the current state of your software is, and it really is helpful. Um, a couple of things that you might want to consider using is Travis CI, which is pretty much, I'm assuming most open source people know what that is now. It's kind of ubiquitous. And um, at, a uh, Vyr, which is made by Microsoft, and it's actually a really, really great system. And not only that, is it tests on Windows computers. And that is actually important because the vast majority of new programmers tend not to be in the Linux or Mac environment. They actually do tend to be in the Windows environment. So making sure that your code can actually successfully be installed and run on the system, that would be great. Uh, the seventh thing, Write an abstract. And what I mean by abstract here is have a paragraph or a sentence that's basically what your project is trying to solve in the world. And the great thing about this is it allows you to stay on target. It makes sure that you're, you have this guide of how to do it. So here's an example of one that I, from one of my uh, libraries that I'm writing. It's for the Mac OS X uh, application day one. So basically it's a simple sentence that I can read and it reminds me, especially when the feature request or something else comes in, that I must maintain this sentence. That's all I'm doing. I'm not adding t issue trackers or time tracking or whatever else. All I'm doing is providing a library and a command line for this application. So the eighth thing is you, ha you have to start saying no to people. And saying no to someone is the hardest thing you'll ever have to do in your life. Because you're, you're telling them basically that their feature request is just too out of scope for your project, and more than likely, you'll feel like you did a bad job about that. I don't think most people can say no and think they did it right. Um, not every PR request that comes in on GitHub should be like merged into your project. Um, I wrote, uh, a little while back, I, I wrote a, a library called Django Contacts I mentioned before, and we had a bunch of, of PR re requests that were basically getting the model to work better with um, Angular, uh, the Angular JavaScript based system. And the problem was is they made so many just insane uh, use cases into the system that it would it basically morphed my entire project to only work with that JavaScript uh, MVC. So just remember to always read your abstract and stay on target. So the ninth thing, kind of contradictory, is to listen to your community. <laughs> um, after you say no to them, make sure that you are listening to them. Uh, understand what their use case for your software is. Uh, a lot of times when you release something, you actually don't know what it's going to be used for by people. So it's kind of an important thing just to make sure that's there. Um, this also brings up another thing is always be respectful to everyone who comes to you. Uh, this, is, this is, you are your project leader. So you are basically the person who is going to be 
the template of all your developers. Everyone's going to follow you. So be respectful to everyone who commits. Be respectful of everything. One thing is if, if as an example, someone commits something and it might not be right to PEP8 standards, don't go on a long comment thread about how using tabs is using hard tabs is stupid and you should only use four lines and blah, blah, blah. Try to approach it from this might be a new user, they might not really understand what's going on and kind of approach it from that. So the last one, enjoyment. You should actually enjoy developing open source software. <laughs> um, burnout in this industry is a horrible thing and we don't talk enough about actually enjoyment of things at all. We love to talk about the gazillions of REST frameworks that are out there, but when anyone talks about enjoying something, we don't like it. And frankly, we're all here on a weekend, so we do actually enjoy this, unless you're getting paid or something of that nature. Um, so if you do hate doing something, really just stop doing it. Maybe go do a different project. Maybe try to, maybe if you have other developers who are also there, try to offshoot it on them. Raise one of them up to be the new, new project lead or something of that nature. Just make sure that you're not getting burnt out on what you're doing. Um, so that's pretty much it. There's the, where you can get the information. And if you ever, you can also contact me at these areas. Hey, thanks a lot, Miles. We've got lots of time for questions, so if you want to come up um, on the Three. side here, um, that'd be great. Oh, sure. There you go. It's basically a GitHub repo that has the markdown formatting of the stuff. Hi, Miles. Hi. What about versioning, like your your piece of software, and what about licenses? Do you consider them like important? Um, I, I, well, I'm kind of a BSD nut, so I can't, I consider licensing extremely important if you're using BSD. If you're not using BSD, then I'm sorry, that's not good. Um, I, I know that's kind of a loaded topic, <laughs> and it's probably not good. Um, well, the reason I actually enjoy BSD as a, as a license, especially in the Pythonic world, is because I, I'm really confused about licensing as a respect, and I like, I like the idea of using a licensing scheme that's similar to what everything I'm building is on top of. So Python is released under BSD, so it makes sense to release my code under BSD. Um, I know there's like a lot of people who like Apache 2, and uh, the MIT license is of course great. Yeah, um, and versioning, do you mean like software versioning, like when you release and things of that nature? When you break capabilities and yeah. Um, yeah, the, I haven't, I, I'm kind of, um, a pack rat in terms of that kind of stuff. Um, basically, you shouldn't do it often. If you're breaking compatibility every year, you're gonna suffer a lot, especially with your development community because they don't know what's going on. Um, I contributed to a rather large database application a long time ago, and they were breaking code co uh, compatibility so much that we lost half our develop, well, I also left. Half of us just basically couldn't take it anymore because it was just so stressful. Because you would be on the IRC and be like, oh yeah, I'm trying to implement the new um, file structure system. And they're like, oh no, that's already been done by somebody else. I think I might have talked too long on that question, <laughs> sorry. Okay, uh, once, once you have all the stuff they have in place, uh, but if you don't have anyone actually using your library, how do you get, how, how do you kind of advertise that? Uh, uh, Twitter is great for that. Um, Hacker, I. Hacker News is also great, but they're not really Pythonic. The Reddit, the, the, the R dash Reddit thing is also good. Um, the, what is, the Python Weekly Newsletter, is that what it's called? I can't remember. They, he, he accepts um, entries a lot, so I would say also publishing it there. Also, what is your open source project? <laughs> um, it's, it's a re-implementation of the built-in Python library for C. What's it called? Uh, no tip. No tip? Uh, uh, Python backwards. Okay, Python backwards? Yeah. Okay. Everyone go check out Python backwards. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, having um, sprints too helps. I, I've never actually done a sprint, so I'm not really 100% sure, but, well, I've, I've gone to sprints. I've never been the guy, like, this is my project we should work on type of guy. But, yeah, that's also good as well.
I lost my mouse and trying to play this again. There it is. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so it appears that you agree that Git is very difficult to use. Have you tried Mercurial? <laughs> I, I have used Mercurial in the past. Um, I was a huge supporter of it, especially during the whole, I don't even, what was that, the, the source control system that, that they used in the Linux kernel before they, they did, pardon? Yeah, before the whole BitKeeper fiasco thing happened, I was very adamant that we should that Mercurial should be the way to go from there. Um, it ended up, I guess, the, the problem is Mercurial just isn't, it's not used well. Like there's not a lot of people using it. Like it's, it's really sad because I do find it actually the superior version control system, but, <laughs> <laughs> but when the vast majority of people are there, like in technology especially, good never wins over widely used. Um, you know, the only things that are coming to mind are horrible examples like Betamax and VHS, which was more of a proprietary, pardon? Linux, yeah, is another example where BSD 360, I think Linus said one time, um, if, if BSD 365 came out before he started Linux, he would have never started Linux because that was adequate at the time. So it's, it's the same type of thing. It's just kind of that kind of stuff. So, Myos, yeah. one other problem I, I face usually, it's when, with abandoned projects. So what, what's your suggestion on that? Like s some people fork it and then you lose the community. Some people give the project away, but sometimes the author doesn't want to give the project away, but he's not working with Django anymore. He's a flasker and it's like, I'll, I'll just accept blindly every single PR that comes up. Like what should we do in an open source environment when there's abandoned projects? A long time ago, this notion came up that we're not allowed to fork things. I believe heavily that forking is important. It doesn't really matter if we have hundreds of libraries that do the same thing, but because the vast majority of time they're all managed by different people. Um, the, the big one that comes to mind that isn't really Pythonic is um, when movable type, uh, that's a blogging software. This, is, they, this also died out a long time ago, but when, when they closed down their open source thing, a bunch of the open source developers moved to something called Open Melody. And it, it did become a superior blogging system, but movable type and Open Melody died at the same time with the rise of like free software. So that was kind of outside of their control. But I do think forking is important and it shows a healthy ecosystem within the entire open source community. Because when you actually have multiple forks of multiple things, there is this idea of difficulty and things like, Nobody, in the science world, if 100 people are working on climate change, well, that's a little serious. If 100 people are working off some mathematical theory or something of that nature, nobody bats an eye. But in software, for some weird reason, we are like, no, we should only have one way of doing this one thing, and you cannot, you're just stupid for even thinking that this one way is, not, is wrong. Like, um, I guess everyone saw the keynote today, and... Um, the, the guy showed that really long import command from Java, Java and stuff, and there was, there was another one where, where no private methods are on Python. Like, those conversations need to happen. And if a fork happens because there can't be a compromise or something, then a, a fork should happen type of a thing. I'm sorry I went on too long. Yeah. <laughs>